Welcome to section 7 of the viruses. This is a figure showing all the viruses you need to know for step 1. In this lecture, we will be discussing hepatinoviridae, or hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is one of the highest yield viruses for step 1. There are a lot of things to know about it, and examiners like to go after intense conceptual material. With that in mind, I will teach you hepatitis B conceptually, then I will help you memorize and lock it all in. If you patiently take in all of the info in this video, you will thank yourself later as you dominate your board exams. So let's get started. This diagram shows the basic structure of hepatitis B. Starting from the outside, we see the surface. This is the location of these surface antigens. These are termed the hepatitis B surface antigens. Going deeper now, we see these proteins which represent the E antigen. These are termed the hepatitis B E antigens. Even deeper, we can see the capsid. This has an icosahedral shape to it. The capsid is considered the core, so the antigens here are considered core antigens, or rather, hepatitis B C antigens. Within the capsid we have the genome, or DNA, which you can see has this circular and partially double-stranded appearance. So there's two strands here, DS for double-stranded, and then right here, it's single-stranded, hence partially double-stranded. And then here's also the DNA polymerase. Now this table describes the details of each antigen as well as the antibodies the body forms against those antigens. Starting with the surface antigen, it's important to know that this is detectable in an acute infection. And it's a glycoprotein, and if it's present for longer than six months, the infection is considered a chronic infection. Now let's talk about the E antigen. This is that polypeptide lying between the core and the surface. Just like the surface antigen was, the E antigen is present in acute infections, and it's present in the early chronic phase for patients that end up developing chronic hepatitis B. The presence of the E antigen indicates a high viral replication taking place. Therefore, it also indicates that the patient is highly contagious or infectious. Next, we see the antibodies against the core. Initially, these take the form of IgM antibodies. Later, there is seroconversion, Seroconversion refers to the type of antibody changing, in this case, from IgM to IgG. In any case, this IgM antibody, which you will see during an acute infection, may be the only marker during the window phase. And we'll discuss the window phase on the next slide. So we've stated that there's a surface antigen, an E antigen, and then a core antibody. So you might be wondering, why isn't there a core antigen present? Well, we don't have the core antigen listed on this table because it's not something that our lab test can detect. We only detect the antibody against the core, which we just discussed. Now the body later forms antibodies against the surface antigen. And once these are present in the body, the patient is considered immune to hepatitis B. This will be seen in the blood of patients who have recovered from the disease or in patients who have been vaccinated. Either way, the patient is considered immune. Next, the body will form antibodies against the E antigen. Once antibodies are formed against the E antigen, the viral replication slows down and the patient is not very contagious. That makes sense because the E antigen, which we discussed up here, indicates high viral replication and contagiousness. So blocking it would confer the opposite. And these antibodies can be present in patients who have recovered, as well as patients who are in the late chronic phase. We'll show you this graphically in a moment. Finally, let's talk about those IgG antibodies, which are formed against the core. These present after seroconversion when the IgG antibodies replace the IgM antibodies. These present after about six months in both chronic or fully recovered patients. Now this diagram shows the level of serologic markers over time. This is specifically referring to someone who clears and recovers from the infection. So they have an acute infection and then they recover. So this diagram does not depict patients that experience chronic infection. And you may find this diagram in several of your review books, but just know that this diagram is not referring to chronic patients. Now notice that between the acute phase and the recovery phase, there's a window phase. So those are the three stages. Going back to the acute phase, Notice that there is DNA detectable, and then starting from time zero, the first thing we see is this red line, which is the surface antigen. Then we have the E antigen, and then antibodies against the core. And again, these are IgM. After about five to six months, this region right here, the surface antigen and the E antigen are no longer detectable. At this point, we've started what's called that window period, and that lasts about a month. Antibodies against the E antigen can be present at this point, but they are often undetectable. So you can see the E antigen right here and the line depicting its level, but it may not be high enough to be detectable. So the marker that's reliably detected during the window phase are these IgM antibodies. You can see the line right here. Near the end of the window phase, we will see two things occur. First, there's seroconversion, and we will see IgG antibodies present. And these, of course, are against the core antigen. Second, antibodies against the surface will develop. 
depicted by this red line. And these are the antibodies you really want because they indicate immunity, as we discussed on the table before. Now this diagram represents the timeline of serologic markers in a patient who does not clear the infection and instead goes from acute to a chronic infection. Many step one resources don't illustrate these high yield points as they relate to chronically infected patients. So pay close attention to this diagram. Just like in the patients who do recover, the acute phase is very similar. We have the surface antigen, then the E antigen presents next, and then the antibodies against the core, starting with the IgM. Now focusing on the red line, which depicts the surface antigen, you notice at the six month mark, it doesn't go down. It's still present, it just continues. And this really defines the chronic infection. And you can also see that there's no antibodies formed against the surface. This makes sense because antibodies against the surface indicate immunity. And if the patient has a chronic infection, they're obviously not immune. Now going to look at the E antigen line, the yellow line, we notice that it didn't dip down at the five to six month mark as it did in the last diagram, which you can see right here. Instead, it continues for a while into the chronic phase and it doesn't dip down until well into this phase, at which point the patient develops antibodies against the E antigen. This makes sense because the patient was unable to clear the infection as normal. So the virus continues replicating longer than expected. And remember, the E antigen indicates high viral replication. Thankfully, in these chronic patients, when they develop these antibodies against the E antigen, they have low transmissibility or low infectivity and they're not as contagious. Now let's dive into the image mnemonic to help you memorize all of the important details of hepatitis B. This scene will take place in a quaint village near some cows that are being attacked by giant bees. These cows have big liver-shaped spots on them, helping you think of the liver in hepatitis. The bees represent the B in hepatitis B. Bringing these ideas together will help you think of hepatitis B. Naturally, big bees have big beehives, which you can see here. This team of marksmen have spotted this big beehive. Notice those pads on the hips of those marksmen? They like to protect their hips because they found the giant bees find it easiest to place their stinger in this hip area where the men can't defend easily with their hands. Anyways, hip pads sounds like hepatinovirus, which is the family to which hepatitis B belongs. These marksmen use bows and arrows to protect their village. The beehive nest symbolizes hepatitis B. These gems on the surface of the hive represent surface antigens, and the arrows are the recurring symbol for antibodies. The fact that these arrows are on the surface of the beehive nest should help you remember that they represent hepatitis B surface antibodies, or antibodies against the surface antigen. Finally, you can see how all the arrows on the bottom of the beehive here are preventing the big beehive from attaching to the ground, indicating that the arrows have prevented infection. Now this village has been attacked before, so they know they need to be immunized against the giant bees in case they get stung. To do this, they break off pieces of the hive surface with its gems included and squeeze the contents through a funnel. At the very end of the funnel is a needle that can be injected into each person in the village. That needle represents vaccination. So this idea will help you remember that hepatitis B vaccines contain service antigens, which confer immunity to hepatitis B. Now look at the army forming this circle here each waiting to get their vaccination. If you look closely, you will see that it not only forms a circle, but it's a partially double file circle instead of single file. There are two rows of men all around the circle until this portion right here, where the men form only a single file line. This represents the fact that the genome of hepatitis B is circular and partially double stranded. These beehives fall from the sky kind of like asteroids. Once contact is made with the ground, the hive opens up and the giant bees begin their infestation. Unfortunately, one of the beehives has already connected with the village, which you can see on this hill over here. These men with the T-shaped flails are trying to destroy the hive as fast as possible. As they are hitting the hive, toxic green goop is spilling on the grass below, killing it. You can see the toxic chemical causing sizzling and destruction of the grass when it touches it. This idea represents the fact that most of the damage to the liver in hepatitis B infections is actually from continual cytotoxic T cell activation. So the toxic green glowing goop on the T flails represents cytotoxic T cells, and the green goop damaging the ground below represents how these toxic T cells cause liver damage. Also notice they've smashed some of those pale blue gems on the surface. These blue gems are made of glass, so when shattered, they look like broken glass. So the little shards of glass on the ground represents the ground glass appearance of the liver biopsy in hepatitis B infections. This is an H&E stain of hepatitis, showing ground glass hepatocytes. As you can see, there are many little eosinophilic particles in the hepatocytes, and this is referred to as ground glass. In the center, you can see that the core of the hive has this icosahedral shape to it. This represents how hepatitis B 
has an icosahedral capsid. This beehive core also has some gems attached to it. This man here is trying to gather some of these gems to sell. Apparently he lost focus of the deadly battle going on around him. He's paying the price for this distraction though, as you can see with the killer bees swarming and attacking him. Now we like to use gems to represent antigens, and the fact that these antigens are on the core indicate that these represent core antigens. When present in the patient's serum, core antigens indicate an active infection, which is represented by the fact that this guy is actively being attacked while holding the core antigens. In the battle, one of the old villagers was shot by an arrow in some friendly fire. You can see him pinned there against the core surrounded by gems. The gems, again, represent core antigens, and the arrow represents antibodies against these core antigens. And the only way to have antibodies against core antigens is by actually having an old infection. Old man represents old infection. Recall from the beginning of the lecture that vaccines include the surface antigens, not the core antigens. So if you see a patient with antibodies against the core antigens, you know they have been infected, and didn't receive that antibody through a vaccine. Now hepatitis B E antigens lie between the outer surface and the inner core. To represent these antigens, we have placed a mountain of gems on the core from which little E-shaped B larvae emerge into the middle of the hive. Look at those babies pouring out there. These babies represent viral replication. After all, if little baby viruses are being made, then the virus must be replicating. So when you see hepatitis B E antigens in the patient's serum, you know that the virus is replicating. Not only that, you know that the patient is highly infectious. Just think E for infectious. Infectious being spelled with an E at the beginning instead of an I. Now you can see one of the archers inside of the core is fully focused on taking out those little E-shaped larvae and has been firing arrows. And he's been firing those at the center of this little gem hill where some babies are trying to come out. This represents antibodies against the E antigens. Antibodies against the E antigen represents low infectivity. That makes sense. If hepatitis B E antigens indicate that the patient is infectious, then anti-E antibodies indicate the patient is not very infectious. Now let's focus on the surface of the beehive. You can see the gems here. This guy is also trying to steal some gems for his personal gain, and like his fellow fighter, he's actively getting attacked by a bee. These gems again represent surface antigens, just like the gems on the surface of the first beehive we introduced in the background. The presence of surface antigens indicates active infection, as emphasized by the actively attacking bee. This other marksman here is not distracted, and he's pinned this bee to the surface of the hive near some gems. This represents antibodies against the surface antigen. This is the exact same idea as represented by the arrows shooting the surface of that first beehive in the background. If there are antibodies against the surface antigen, then the patient has immunity. You may have already realized this, but surface antibodies can come from vaccination or through fighting off the viral infection yourself. This means that if you see anti-surface antibodies, you don't know whether or not the patient obtained these antibodies through vaccination or from an old infection. Now look at this woman here. She was just trying to warn those men with the arrows shooting the hive that the bees were going to come attack them soon. Unfortunately, her warning drew these two bees toward her instead. Look at them ready to attack this well-intentioned villager. This woman's wearing a scarlet letter. This is the recurring symbol for sexually transmitted diseases. So hepatitis B can be transmitted through sexual intercourse. And this woman happens to be pregnant. This represents the fact that hepatitis B can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. This sister of the pregnant woman was also out to warn those guys. Even though she is sick and on this IV drip, she felt a duty to warn them. Hepatitis B can also be transmitted through IV drug use. And we wanted to help you remember this by having her on that IV drip. She's obviously pretty sick, so she keeps that IV medicine dripping into her at all times. So again, hepatitis B can be transmitted sexually or through the placenta or through IV drug use. Now we see a long branch with a bird's nest on the end. We like to use eggs in a nest like this to represent incubation, like cute little incubating chicken eggs. The fact that the branch is long indicates the incubation period is long. So from the time the patient contracts hepatitis B, to the time that they have active infection, it's considered long. All right, now let's move on to discuss the possible clinical outcomes of hepatitis B. Hepatitis B infections can go in a few different directions. It can be an acute infection that resolves within six months, and that's the most common outcome. Symptoms can include arthralgias, rash, fever, and jaundice. And patients may be asymptomatic, also called anecteric, meaning no scleral icterus from the jaundice. Another outcome is fulminant liver failure and hepatic necrosis. This is extremely dangerous and thankfully pretty rare. Now patients may get an acute infection and not recover and instead have it just proceed to a chronic infection. And this can be stable. In other words, it doesn't progress to anything else. They just have a chronic hepatitis B infection. However, a chronic infection can progress to liver cirrhosis. And a patient with a chronic infection who develops liver cirrhosis 
can also develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And the last outcome is a chronic infection that leads directly to a hepatocellular carcinoma without ever developing liver cirrhosis. Now we have a way to help you remember each of these potential outcomes. First, let's look at this cow snagged by a giant bee. As the bee ascended, it got the cow stuck in these fibrous branches. These scraggly branches represent cirrhosis. In cirrhosis, hepatocytes become fibrotic and gnarled, kind of like these branches are. The fact that these branches, like a long gnarly fibers, are wrapping around the cow, the cow with that liver-shaped spot, should help you remember the fibrotic changes that occur in the liver in cirrhosis. Liver cirrhosis can progress to hepatocellular carcinoma. To help you remember this, we've added a big pink ribbon to the cow, which is our recurring symbol for cancer. The fact that this ribbon is on that cow, which represents liver cirrhosis, should help you remember that cirrhosis can lead to cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. Now look at this cow down here on the ground. She has a cancer ribbon, but she's not caught in those gnarled fibrous branches. This represents the fact that the patients with chronic hepatitis B infections can actually develop hepatocellular carcinoma even without first progressing to liver cirrhosis. Some chronic hep B patients skip the cirrhosis and go straight for the cancer. Now look at this cow here. It's stuck in the stable just underneath the cirrhotic scraggly tree. The bee trying to take it away cannot because it's blocked by the roof of the stable. This represents chronic infections that are stable and do not progress to cirrhosis or cancer. Now this cow has just been stung by a bee and is now being taken off. I guess the cow must have struggled and fought too much, so the bee just killed him. That poor cow is shriveled up and dead now. The bee sting must be pretty toxic. Anyways, this necrotic-looking cow represents liver necrosis and death, or the fulminant liver failure that can occur during the acute phase. Now, as mentioned before, the most common outcome of hepatitis B infections is simply acute hepatitis. This includes fever, arthralgias, and sometimes a rash. To represent this, we have this cow getting smacked and scraped up against this tree as it ascends. And you can see those banged up joints representing arthralgias, and you can see the rash from the scraping against the tree. As with most infections of any kind, acute hepatitis can cause fever. To help you remember this, we have this old oil lamp hanging from this tree branch here. We like to use lamps like this to represent fever. Acute hepatitis, inflammation of the liver, can cause jaundice. To help you remember this, we have included this cow totally drenched in honey. Now it has this orange-yellow color. This bee, getting ready for an epic feast, covered it in honey. In any case, this yellow honey-drenched cow represents jaundice. Now we have this kid over here to the right. Look how happy he is. He's giving a thumbs up. He's pretty happy that his precious cow hasn't been harmed by the bees. Look at that cow, it's totally safe. The unharmed cow and the happy boy represent an asymptomatic presentation, which commonly occurs in acute hepatitis. This can also be called anicteric hepatitis, meaning there's no scleral icterus or jaundice in the patient because they are asymptomatic. To emphasize that acute hepatitis with resolution is the most common outcome, we have shown several bees with several of these cows representing acute hepatitis. So again, acute hepatitis with resolution, whether or not it's symptomatic, is more common than liver failure, chronic hepatitis with or without cirrhosis, or hepatitis that becomes cancer. Now look at this bee trying to carry this big cow here. The small bee is apparently succeeding since the cow is actually getting lifted off the ground. Did you notice how the cow is totally unharmed? There's nothing on the cow represent necrosis, cirrhosis, cancer, or arthralgias, or anything representing acute hepatitis. You could say that this cow is asymptomatic. So this cow is asymptomatic and being carried. Bringing these two ideas together represents asymptomatic carriers, which are common in hepatitis B. Now let's discuss other conditions associated with hepatitis B infections. First is polyarteritis nodosa. To represent this disease, we have these mean bees tying these red ropes around this man's belly, squeezing it hard. The red ropes represent blood vessels. The fact that they are around his belly should help you remember that this type of vasculitis polyarteritis nodosa involves vessels of the visceral organs, and the fact that the red ropes are squeezing this man's belly represents the extreme abdominal pain polyarteritis nodosa can cause. And you can see that the bees squeezed his belly so hard that the poor guy pooped out this nasty melena, which of course represents melena. This will help you remember the melena present in patients with polyarteritis nodosa. Just prior to the bee attack, the village was about to throw a party using these multicolored balloons. These bees are totally party poopers, so they started stabbing the balloons, popping them before they can even get out of this container. The balls inside the container represent the progenitor blood cells in the bone marrow. So the fact that the bees are destroying these balloons should make you think of blood cells trapped in the bone marrow, which is kind of like aplastic anemia, failure of the bone marrow to produce new blood cells. Before our polyarteritis nodosa guy was ensnared by these squeezing ropes, he tried throwing a big bag of kidney beans at the bees flying above him. Unfortunately, he missed, and now the bees want to torture him. 
and we've already discussed his torture. Anyways, after missing its intended target, the bag of kidney beans landed on the roof of this little storage shelter. Kidney beans can now be seen spilling on the roof, and you can see the beans blocking the rain gutter from draining properly, and you can also see arrows which have impaled the rain gutter because of all the arrow men trying to shoot down the bees, but missing. Anyways, these kidney beans reinforce that this is a kidney pathology, and the rain gutter represents the basement membrane of the glomerulus. The arrows represent antibody complexes which cause damage to the basement membrane. This represents membranous glomerulonephropathy. We see that some of the kidney beans have spilled on the other side of the roof as well. And you can see the rain gutter here has become frayed, and it looks like it's actually proliferating or growing in some way. Notice how many little strands were created by the arrows flaying the rain gutter. It's almost like the rain gutter is proliferating. This represents the proliferation in membranoproliferative glomerulonephropathy. This is mediated by immune complexes as well. So there are arrows damaging these rain gutters too. Now there's a well here that the village uses to provide water to its people. If you look closely, you will see one rope is becoming two ropes. This represents the fact that hepatitis B has reverse transcriptase, which causes a single strand of RNA to become double-stranded DNA, important for replication of the virus. Now, reverse transcriptase is typically used only by retroviruses, such as HIV or HTLV. However, hepatitis B has reverse transcriptase in spite of not being a retrovirus. So this is an important fact to remember. Hepatitis B has reverse transcriptase. This diagram depicts an abbreviated replication cycle of hepatitis B. So here's reverse transcriptase. Let me explain why it's important. So first the virus enters the cell and you can see that it's partially double-stranded DNA. It will then enter the nucleus and it gets repaired by host DNA polymerase. So now it's fully double-stranded. After that, RNA polymerase will make mRNA, which you can see leaving the nucleus and entering the cytoplasm. The mRNA is then translated into virulent proteins. Reverse transcriptase is made from mRNA, and then it will then act on the mRNA and build partially double-stranded DNA. This new double-stranded DNA can be packaged with the virulent proteins and form new virions, which can go and perpetuate the life cycle of hepatitis B. The point is, reverse transcriptase is very important to complete the life cycle of hepatitis B. Lastly, notice these sheepdogs trying to rescue those captured cows. These dogs represent hepatitis D. Hepatitis D has its own image with dogs that look very similar to these. Instead of going into a lot of detail regarding those dogs, just know that hepatitis D needs hepatitis B in order to be infectious. Now that we've covered all the parts in this image, let's do a question to apply this. A 43-year-old male presents to the clinician for hepatitis B serology laboratory work in preparation for a new nursing job at the local hospital. He denies any prior history of IV drug use and denies sexual intercourse with at-risk individuals. A review of his past medical history indicates he has received all age-appropriate vaccinations. Based on the patient's history, which of the following most likely reflects his lab results? A. Positive for antibodies against the surface and positive for antibodies against the core and positive for E antigens. B, negative for antibodies against the surface and positive for antibodies against the core and negative for E antigen. C, positive for antibodies against the surface, negative for antibodies against the core and negative for E antigens. And D, negative for antibodies against the surface, negative for antibodies against the core, and negative for E antigens. Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this patient likely has not acquired a hepatitis B infection and that he has been vaccinated. So what would be the serological test results in this patient? Answer choice C, positive against antibodies against the surface, negative for antibodies against the core, and negative for E antigens. Recall from the image that patients who are vaccinated have antibodies against surface antigens which we've depicted right here. Whereas people who have cleared the infection have antibodies against the surface, represented by this antibody arrow, and they will have antibodies against the core and antibodies against the E antigen. Choice A is wrong because he would not have antibodies formed against the core antigen and he should not have any E antigens. Choice B is wrong because this patient would not have antibodies against the core antigen, although he would be negative for the E antigen. Lastly, choice D is wrong because he should have antibodies against the surface, and this suggests he doesn't. And correctly, it assumes that he would not have antibodies against the core and that he would not have E antigens. So the correct answer is C. And that should be all you need to know about hepatitis B.